I guess we wanted to start uh, by talking about you have yet another new book about motorcycles, about traveling, about being on the road, about uh, snow, everything. A lot of snow in there too. Uh, how do you find so much time to be able to? You not only have this ex this exhausting touring schedule, then you ride between shows. I guess first, how did when did you start? Riding between shows. This is, sounds like an arrangement that that is, is perfect for you. Yeah, it, it actually evolved from I used to carry a bicycle on the tour bus in the 80s, and then days off I would get out, out and ride around the countryside, and show days I would ride around the city and, and to the show, and it became such a nice bit of independence and nature and being out with other humans outside of the cage, what touring life can absolutely be and very alienating for a lot of people where this got me out in the world every day and then in the 90s I started getting interested in motorcycling and did some adventure travel around the Canadian Arctic and down to Mexico and, and so I think well I wonder if this would work for business travel and can see well if I had a bus I could sleep on the bus and, and keep the bikes in the trailer and um, ride off on, on days off between shows and then show up for the next show so we tried it that tour and, and it not only worked it was wonderful to the freedom to explore that i suddenly had which first what was the first tour to do and this? uh test for echo in the okay. 90, 95 96 96 97 oh, so it's a while then you've been had this arrangement uh yeah yeah all that uh, every tour since then and i've been able to do it all around europe south america even uh we had a, a south american leg a few years back and i saw four days off between um brazil and uh, buenos aires and it, with my writing partner, I said, could we do it? And, and once I found out it could be done, mm. it had to be done. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but it was so nerve wracking because there was no bus and trailer or backup bike then. It was just the two of us on our bikes and we had to get there. And in Southern Brazil, we got hopeless, hopelessly lost. And you know, n no one speaks English for a hundred miles. And just by the help of other people though, as, as I found traveling everywhere in the world in, uh, Africa and Mexico when you're in trouble people will help and uh, we got out of that we made it to the show and everything but it was so nerve-wracking because I, I there's a huge responsibility when 10,000 people are waiting for you to show up for work right yeah. for most people if, you, if you're a few minutes late for work no big deal but in a, in a case like that I feel such as a sense of um, demanding um, urgency to get there on a show day and the first tour when I started doing it I told my writing partner if we're um, less than an hour early we're late <laughs> now it's such a like t you uh, you have a bus you have a trailer you have a spare bike you have a, a rider to ride with you it's a lot of setup to uh, to do this but how important is it is it because it's a major is it a decompression thing after a show or before a show to, to just get on that bike the independence the same thing that appealed to me with the bicycle the very first time that I was able to ride a bicycle between two cities and I think it was like a, a city in um, maybe Charlotte and Greensboro in the Carolinas it was a uh, hundred miles apart and a hundred miles is a, is a good distance to do in a day on a bicycle, on a bicycle yes. yeah but when when I was left behind that day and the and the bus and the rest of the band and everybody else went ahead and I was there by myself it was such a great feeling mm -hmm. and uh, riding by myself it was up to that was long before the days of cell phones this in the 80s right. and uh, learning how to change a flat tire and do the repairs along the way and that sense of independence and apartness from the machine that touring can become. Well it's funny a lot of bands see that moment where they're able to fly between shows as like that's the pinnacle moment to reach and as soon as you got to that moment you're like no I want to I want to slug it out of this bus. And I hate it that they call flyover country, yeah. like the center US, right? There's New York and there's LA and the flyover country. No, no, no. I want to fly over LA, ride across the country, and fly over New York. Yeah, yeah. I guess there's a romantic idea of, of motorcycles and there's a romantic idea of musicians. And there's always seems to be a tie in between musicians and motorcycles. A lot of famous musicians really, I guess, enjoy motorcycles. There's something about the thrill of it. Like, do you see a, a tie in at all? Like. I read that you you don't listen to music at all when you do ride, no. but yet music plays, it plays in your head. It, it plays inevitably so in my does head. That, so does that act of writing then inform your music at all, or lyrics, or anything? Uh, I think it's the act of traveling, honestly. Right. And uh, the motorcycle. There's a beautiful book called The Perfect Vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, Melinda McPherson, and. Um, that kind of describes it for me. I liked bicycling for many years and still definitely value the bicycle as an excellent mode of transport, especially in cities. But when I suddenly had the greater scope of being able to travel, and I choose the very smallest roads when I travel, and I honestly, uh, musicians might pose with motorcycles, but I don't know anybody else that right. tours that way. But um, I choose the very smallest roads and the very um, smallest towns and try to stay in the small towns. And I only go to cities to play, really. 
a term I've never heard of before, shun piking. Uh huh. You remember in your book, I'm like, and that is the act of finding the smallest roads. Avoiding turnpikes, and, and yeah. that's what it, it comes from. And it, it's an ancient word as it happens from, like the, in the 1500s, um, pikes were put across roads to protect the villages from highwaymen and night travelers. And then toll roads were invented at the same time, 500 years ago, and the pike had to be turned so you paid your toll and they turned to the pike. So shun pikers avoided toll roads. Mm -hmm. And in modern times you avoid interstates or, or motorways or auto routes or whatever in favor of the smallest roads. And now with GPS technology it's so wonderful because I can go to the map of whatever state I'm in or whatever province and pick the tiniest little roads and put them on the, the GPS. And it may not be 100% reliable because they're the smallest roads. Right. And we call them the mystery roads because sometimes the GPS doesn't even find that road. And the next day it may be improvising as much as we are. But that's a beautiful part of traveling too is the improvisation aspect of it, the adaptation to make a good traveler, mm -hmm. you better be ready to adapt to any old thing in terms of weather or mechanical breakdown or um, time sensitivity or traffic as simple as that. You know, traffic has changed my plans lots of times yeah. too. Now uh, a lot of things you write about are the encounters between, you have the big shows and that's what everybody thinks is this is the, what everybody wants to know about, but you write a lot about the encounters between shows, about with, with just I guess getting away from that tour, getting into the everyday life, going but, to diners and it so keeps me rooted. There's not a single day goes by that I don't have a conversation with somebody in a gas station or yeah. Yeah, somebody in a diner or the motel and just regular human to human interaction. And that's what I was saying about the bubble that touring can mm -hmm. sometimes be and what everybody looks at you a certain way and talks at you a certain way. It can be alienating and for me very uncomfortable. And so that's, that's my professional milieu of fine, but I don't have to live in that bubble and that's the greatest reward I was saying before it's not about the motorcycling necessary or the scenery or the landscapes it's about the mental state of getting away from that mm -hmm. and thinking about um, what I'm traveling through and other people's lives that's what I love being in tune with every day and I, I drive past people working in the fields and think about them and I drive past people going about their jobs and going about their lives and kids at school and this whole life's rich pageant right mm -hmm. that's going around us all the time when you live in a bubble it's hard to um, stay in touch with that and that's that's the world especially as a writer you, you need to stay in touch with right other people's lives or, or the essence of what I want to do in sharing won't be possible because you're writing for some from some ivory tower to people whose lives you don't even have the slightest notion of right Absolutely. so that would be that would be a, a tremendous handicap as a writer and I guess it gives you like a sense of anonymity as well as opposed to private jet to guy on a bike. Yeah, I mean, you can protect your privacy in those ways. That's yeah. a good analogy. Is that, yeah, inevitably, uh, the, one of the hardest lessons we learned w along the way, fortunately, we became popular fairly gradually so we could adapt to it and help each other adapt to it. But yeah, there's the first time you ever have to hire security for your dressing room door. It's like, what? For the first few years, our dressing room door was in to open to anyone who ever wanted to come in. Chances, you know, happens that nobody did. Yeah. <laughs> so th that was the reality. And then suddenly when things change, and, and one of our live albums around that time I wrote a little note in it uh, you know we're sorry for any friends that we're out of touch with and all that and just remember we didn't change everybody else did and that's what it seems like to you at the time so yeah you can put up um, in the song limelight one can put up barriers to keep oneself intact mm -hmm. or you can jump right out of that and it just occurred to me that that are the that those are the two choices right you can yeah. either put up uh, barriers around you or get out of that circle because yeah people don't expect to see me and there are many times I've, I've been around someplace and somebody with a rush t-shirt on you know and it will just not notice me because I'm some guy at a gas right. station or some guy sitting in a diner they're not expecting to see me there yeah, so I, I always love those moments when uh, I, I realize that I, I've achieved that independence and I just want to be that guy I like having conversations with people on an everyday basis I don't want them looking at me like some alien being. It seems like you're you are a man of your streams. Like you don't just drum. You drum on one of the largest kits there is. You don't just ride motorcycles. You ride fifty thousand miles. <laughs> I'm <Like> extremist. <laughs> even when you you describe your appetite for reading too, it seems like a voracious appetite for reading. Like I guess is it is that a is that I guess is that what got you where you are as a drummer? Even? I, I would expect that it all comes down to a kind of restlessness mm -hmm. because I've, when people talk about boredom, for example, I can honestly say I've never been bored for a second in my life, but I've always found another way not to be. And like if I have to go to a medical appointment, I'm like, I bring a book with me. So that waiting is not going to be a hardship. But the early days of touring when all that dead time was hanging yeah. on me, reading, portable, useful, you know, nurturing, all that stuff. So I, I think I combat, you, you learn to adapt to your own personality and, uh, and the, the extremes do come in there too. Yeah, I wanted to read every book ever written. Uh, Drumming-wise, um, my 
determination was more important than, than talent early on. I think for most things you do have to have a bit of a knack, but I, I had to work so hard to learn so many things, but I was um, relentless in terms of determination. And with traveling when I've got a day, I, I'm tempted by what's the most excellent thing I can do, which might be way too far, way too long, but I'm going to go for that because it's the most excellent thing sure. I can do. And with writing, it, it just seems unstinting in the same way because um, I, have a, I just kind of know when I've done my best on it, mm -hmm. and maybe an, an editor can help make it better, and, and maybe somebody else could have written it better, but I, I have a good built-in sense of this is the best I can do. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, the host of Shift on CBC Radio 2. Thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw, see some more. Subscribe, you can get them all. Leave us some comments. Tell your friends. There's all kinds of great videos here on the CBC Music Channel.